to the dreamers who imagine the impossible, who inspire the world with their ideas, and strive to provide clear answers for early and accurate diagnosis, for better outcomes, for better health, for every patient. Bayer wants to join you and make this dream come true. My journey continues, and I know I'm not alone. Because together, we can make a difference every day. Session on channel one for ASCII, for, uh, ASCII 2021. Uh, the title of this session is ASCII meets NASCII, North American Society of Cardiovascular Imaging. I'm joined here uh, today also by uh, another chairperson, uh, Dr. Uh, Van uh, Bu. He is a uh, associate professor of radiology at the Hanoi Medical University, and he is currently vice president of the Vietnamese Society of Radiology. And we have been uh, having this exchange between NASCI and ASCII for many years, and I personally have found it very valuable. To, um, to interact and make connections with uh, different groups around the world and share ideas, and, and this one has been certainly productive. Before we introduce our first speaker, I want to give Dr. Bu an opportunity uh, to introduce himself and say welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be here with you. I think that's uh, this very interesting session. And, uh, uh, please, you can invite the person speaker and uh, uh, all the speaker will uh, stay with us at the end of the section. We, and we will uh, have uh, the answer and question at the end of the section. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, and that is Dr. Uh, Ordovas from University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, where she is Section Chief of Cardiothoracic Imaging in uh, the Radiology Department. She is a past president of NASCI. Her specialty is in advanced cardiac and pulmonary imaging, particularly cardiovascular MR and CT. And we're looking forward to hearing her first talk on patients with pacemakers, ICDs, is this safe for CMR? Dr. Ordovas, welcome. Greetings, everyone. My name is Kiana Ordovas, and I'm a professor of radiology and cardiology at the University of Washington in the United States. I'm also past president of the North American Society of Cardiac Imaging, and it's my honor to be here today representing our society in the Asian Society of Cardiac Imaging annual meeting. We're going to be discussing safety of imaging patients with pacemaker and ICDs, particularly for cardiac MRI. I'm, as disclosures, I'm treasurer of the Society of Cardiovascular MRI. So, cardiac MRI in patients with pacemaker and ICDs is going to be discussed in the lecture and I'm going to refer to those devices as cardiac implantable electronic devices and those include cardiac pacemakers, implantable cardioverter defibrillators and cardiac resynchronization therapy devices. The importance of this discussion is that there are recent estimates that suggest that about 1.4 million new devices are implanted annually worldwide. So more and more we're going to be faced with the decision of scanning or not a patient that has an implantable electronic device. 
The first question we face is how to identify precisely what kind of device. Most patients are going to have registered notes about the device that was implanted, but if that's absent, the most, the safest way of identifying the device is through chest radiograph. I'm going to show you a few examples here of the image appearance of these devices. First, a simple dual chamber pacemaker. What we're seeing here is the generator. We see those very long wires and we see uh, the lead projecting over the right atrium and the right ventricle. Second type of device is the biventricular pacemaker for resynchronization therapy. In those devices you're going to see again leads overlying the right atrium and right ventricle and you're going to see a th third lead that courses through the coronary sinus in one of the cardiac veins uh, to provide pacing for the left ventricle. Transvenous defibrillators uh, have this classic image appearance of a long high density shock coil, usually two of them, one overlying the superior vena cava and one along the right ventricle. You may also encounter those devices that have a combination of defibrillator and resynchronization therapy, as in this case in which you see those long high density defibrillator coils, but you also see a left ventricular pacing lead. More recently, there are some new options for uh, cardiac pacing, and those are called the wireless pacemaker devices. The most commonly used is called Micra. So you're going to see this device projecting over the apex of the right ventricle with no appreciated leads or wires, I should say. And finally, uh, subcutaneous ICDs are now frequently uh, applied in patients uh, that need an implantable device and what you're going to see is a subcutaneous generator, that long wire and uh, the long high density defibrillator wire projecting over the subcutaneous tissue. It's very important to identify patients that contain abandoned leads or epicardial leads and that's because these patients have a higher risk for cardiac excitation and TP heating, presumably because of lack of grounding effect of the generator. I'm showing you two examples here. First patient has a generator uh, and the defibrillator leads and also uh, a bunch of wires and the defibrillator leads that are not connected to any generator. So those are considered abandoned, usually because of difficulty extracting the leads um, during extracting procedures. Uh, what we're seeing here is a different case of a patient that contains an epicardial uh, defibrillator or pacemaker lead. We see the generator here and we see this um, lead that extends into the epicardial region providing pacing, uh, not through a transvascular approach. Now, what are the indications for CMR in patients that contain uh, cardiac electronic devices? Well, there's mainly two main clinical scenarios that lead a patient with a device to need a cardiac MRI. First one is a patient that has a defibrillator and is suffering frequent shocks. In that setting, CMR is done to look for the arrhythmogenic substrate and to facilitate ablation procedure. Also to guide the epicardial or endocardial approach for the ablation procedure. The second indication are those patients that have a device but have worsening heart failure. So the specific diagnosis of the cardiac disease can change management. CMR usually aids in defining if a lesion is ischemic or non-ischemic and informing treatment choices. Let me show you two examples here. One of a patient uh, with an ischemic injury and one with a non-ischemic injury. You can see vertical long axis late gadolinium enhancement image with a subendocardial air of hyperintensity in the anterior and apical walls consistent with a myocardial infarction. In contrast to that, you see a patient with a classic non-ischemic pattern in the setting of sarcoidosis. So what we're seeing here is areas of hyperintensity that are patchy and subepicardial in the lateral wall and also in a mid-wall distribution at the level of the septum. When planning a ventricular ablation, CMR can actually guide uh, the procedure, especially when there's challenging locations for SCAR. 
These are examples of a challenging and an easy target for ventricular fibrillation ablation. First example is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, apical type, and you can see this area of hypertrophy and very extensive scar in the left ventricular apex. When performing ablation, the electrophysiologist would not be able to map the scar through an endocardial approach or an epicardial approach. And therefore, MR is going to very, be very important to guide this procedure. Here we have an example of what's usually an easy target for ablation. We have a very focal, small area of transmural-late gadolinium enhancement in the lateral wall, uh, usually in patients that have had an emboli or a very small ischemic injury. Let's focus now on safety considerations. Patients uh, that have devices and are exposed to magnetic field and radiofrequency pulses during a CMR examination, uh, these may affect those devices in several different ways. Here, a few of most common ways the device can be altered uh, by an MRI examination. You may have loss of battery voltage, the lead impedance may change, the ventricular sensing amplitude may, may increase, you may have loss of pacemaker capture or change in the threshold for capture. Uh, the thresholds for ventricular and atrial pacing may increase, may have changes in P and R wave amplitudes, and finally, the electro res uh, reset of the device may happen. So these are all described in animal studies and laboratory studies and our potential risks that we have when pacemakers and uh, the fibrillators are exposed to the MRI field. More recently, Devices are now operating uh, with special optimizations to decrease the effects of the electromagnetic field on the structure of the device, particularly at 1.5 Tesla. Multiple optimizations have been performed on several components of the devices to allow uh, an MRI field exposure without significant damage to the structure. Those are the so-called MR conditional devices uh, or MR safe devices as described in some, some literature. So what configures an MR conditional device? So it's a device that has been demonstrated to pose no known hazard within specific conditions of use and that's why it's labeled conditional. So those conditions of use uh, are respect to the configuration of the device, the specific device programming during the MR examination, and uh, specific staff requirement for programming and patient monitoring. So under those conditions, this uh, MR can be, this device can be exposed to the magnetic field for clinical purposes. In contrast to that, we have what's called the MR non-conditional or legacy devices. These are older devices that haven't met regulatory criteria to be labeled as condition. So um, in practice, they have often been considered as unsafe for the MR environment. They are manufactured before the year 2000 and are now from, by many societies and um, teams being considered a relative contraindication for MRI. So when you're interrogating a device and you want to know the status condition versus non-conditioning, uh, it's very common to refer to the MRI safety website. It's a very useful website in which you describe the type of device, the strength of the magnetic field, and it's going to label for you if the device is conditional uh, or non-conditional. It's important to keep in mind that the fibrillators have increased risk uh, for safety abnormalities compared to pacemaker. And that's due to higher ferromagnetic mass, more conductive materials, higher translational force, vibration and heating risk, and higher lead complexity. So the MagnaSafe registry was really a landmark in uh, the field of safety of conditional cardiac devices. In 2017, it was published, and it, it involved 1,000 pacemakers and 500 defibrillators 
uh, and showed no cases of the vice or lead failure in these examinations when conducted in a 1.5 Tesla of these non-conditional devices. This safety registry generated expert opinion papers, particularly important is this one published in the Hard Rhythm Journal, uh, that really detail recommendations on how to scan patients with um, cardiovascular devices, particularly non-conditional ones. And those were endorsed by the American Heart Association, College of Cardiology, and College of Radiology as class one recommendation when the devices are conditional and class 2A recommendation when the MR are, the devices are non-conditional. More recently, adding to this body of literature on safety of devices was a large multi-center study that looked at more than a thousand exa MR examinations in 970 patients, including non-MR conditional system and defibrillators. And in this study, there was no increased risk of MRI in patients with this non-conditional defibrillators and uh, pacemakers. This is an uh, in-press article in the European Heart Journal. It's important to minimize the risks to the device prior and during the examination. Prior to the examination, it's important to adjust the pacemaker settings to specific settings that decrease the uh, chance of the device being affected by the magnetic field. For ICD, it's important to turn off the ICD in patients that are known pacer dependent for sensing and for therapy. During the examination, it's important to consent the patients of the unknown small risks of damage to the device uh, and about lead heating and potential generator of myocardial scar that may lead to changes in threshold of a defibrillator device. Um, finally, it's important to discuss that during the examination, it may be difficult to treat a sudden arrhythmia as a patient is monitored usually by uh, a glass separation or a monitor device. Adjusting the MRI sequences to decrease the SAR is very important as well. SAR is basically the amount of energy that is delivered to the device or to the patient during the examination. And some specific sequences have lower SAR and should be uh, selected for these examinations. And finally, close monitoring of the patient during the study is uh, required with pulse, oximetry, heart rate, and EKG. There has been a recent publication by Dr. Gulani and Dr. Leet on their experience uh, on developing an organized institutional workflow for safety of scanning patients with devices. We have a similar workflow in our institution that includes proper patient screening, device programming, scan monitoring, and pre and post ICD examinations. And those have been shown to minimize risks for patients with conditional and non-conditional devices. Here you can see the workflow is starting with identifying the patient, discussing the need for MRI examination, defining if the device is conditional or non-conditional, and then following proper recommendations for both. After that, you need to establish that the patient is patient dependent and follow recommendations for cases in which the patient is or is not patient dependent. Now, after you get uh, approval for examination due to safety considerations, it's important to understand that the presence of a device may cause significant artifacts. So that's due to metal, which causes field distortion and may lead to off-resonance artifacts. The typical inversion pulse for the late gadolinium enhancement sequence, which is the most useful sequence for scar mapping in this population, is 1.1 kilohertz. And distortion is between 2 and 6 kilohertz. That's the typical inversion pulse. So if you can widen that bandwidth, you may decrease the artifact formation. Here's an example of a patient that was submitted to a late gadolinium enhancement examination. You can see this very 
large artifact caused by the presence of the device. The artifact is influenced by the proximity of the device and ICDs usually generate more artifacts than pacemakers. Example of a classic Cine image performed with the steady state free precession sequence showing very significant susceptibility artifact uh, causing the study to be non-diagnostic. Here, phase sensitive inversion recovery sequences showing this classic central signal void and peripheral hyperintensity uh, in patients with the presence of devices. There has been improvements in CMR sequences to diminish the effects of the leads in the quality of the image. The, the strategies usually lead to interpretable results, though the most common sequences that can be used to improve image quality are spoiled gradient echo sequences instead of the classic balanced steady state for precession sequences, sequences with short echo times, and finally late gadolinium enhancement sequence with a wide bandwidth. Non steady state free precession sequences can provide Cine images with much less artifact, as shown in this example with the spoiled grid and echo sequence, in which we can see in a four chamber and short axis views the presence of the lead, a little bit of susceptibility artifact around it, but still very good image quality that leads to precise quantification of cardiac function and volumes. Now, when we talk about late gadolinium enhancement, a really game changer was um, the development of this modified sequence that has a lot wide bandwidth by Dr. Ping, who in the UCLA institution. Uh, Dr. Leet has provided me with this examples of same patient with a, a regular inversion recovery sequence and one performed with a wide band approach. And you can see how the artifact is completely removed and I can identify that wide area of transmitter late gadolinium enhancement. Other examples of the wide band late gadolinium enhancement sequence here in a three dimensional approach in which you see the leads, you see some minor artifact, but you still have very good image quality. A two dimensional approach showing the lead, minimal artifact, and extensive area of late gadolinium enhancement easily detected. Here I'm showing you a three-dimensional LGE with very significant artifact that precludes the diagnosis. And when uh, approaching with a wide band sequence, you can see how the device goes away and I can clearly, I should say the artifact goes away and I can clearly appreciate the low signal throughout the myocardium. Another example of a patient now with cardiac sarcoidosis, the usual late gadolinium enhancement sequence showing a lot of artifact from the device and the modified wide band sequence showing a clear subepicardial late gadolinium enhancement uh, in this case of sarcoidosis. More recently, there has been studies showing the safety of actually scanning patients with abandoned bleeds. There was a recent patient uh, study that looked at 139 patients and showed that there were actually no changes in battery voltage power on reset events or pacer, pacing rate in this particular patient. So we may see in the near future recommendations for actually allowing us to scan patients with abandoned leads. So in conclusion, CMR can indeed be performed with good image quality in patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices that need a study for clinical management. Familiarity of the physician with the safety procedures is really key for the success of this program. And the risk of device complication is close to none if safety procedures are followed precisely. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here and specifically thank Dr. Avanti Gulani for her help preparing this presentation and Dr. Harold Lead for providing beautiful examples uh, of late gadolinium enhancement wideband from his institution. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, Professor Odova, for the excellent presentation. I think that's a, there's a lot of questions concerning the presentation. And please stay with us at the end of the session for the Q&A. And uh, we move uh, to the next presentation of uh, Professor Wenli come from the Korea. 
He's a professor in the radiology department of Seoul National University Hospital and Seoul National University College of Medicine. He's an international liaison director of the Korean Society of Radiology and office director of the Asian Ocean Society and, uh, of Radiology. And uh, his topic is very hard, especially in Vietnam, where we see the patient dying due to the contrast media reaction. Please, Dr. Um, Professor Wan Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your nice introduction, uh, Dr. Jiang. I'm Mari, and I'll be talking about the recent update of city contrast media safety. Uh, in city contrast media safety, there is a, a, a two issue concerned. One is a contrast induced uh, nephropathy, and the other one is hypersensitivity reaction. Let's just start from the contrast induced uh, nephropathy. I will start with a quite old uh, journal published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine at 2003. In that paper, uh, Dr. Peter Asperlin uh, concluded that contrast media induced nephropathy will develop in high-risk patients appear to be significantly reduced when eodixanol or isosomal contrast media is used than the other low osmolar contrast media. At the time, the uh, company of uh, eodixanol uh, production is uh, Amosham Healthcare, and they compare their new product, VCPAC, EODXANOL to EOHEXOL, OMNIPAC. So I got this photo at uh, 2005 at Stanford, two years later of the NEJM publication. In the CT room, they use VCPAC in patients with any possible uh, kidney dysfunction patient. And then 2007, there is uh, some recommendation from Cardiology Society. In chronic kidney disease patient undergoing angiography, isosomal contrast agent, that means VZPAC, eodixanol, are indicated and are preferred. And then the level of evidence is A. But after this guideline, there are so many comparison studies uh, between VZPAC and the other component from the other companies. So when they pulled up all the studies, EOHEXOL, the, uh, the first uh, agent compared to the VZPAC, shows inferiority uh, to VZPAC. But the other uh, contrast media, EOMEPRO, EOPAMIDOL, EOPROMIDE, and EOBESOL, and all the uh, contrast media has uh, actually not different or better uh, profile in nephropathy compared to the eodixano. And there is other meta-analysis after uh, one year. And then also this, uh, except the aspirin, the NEJM paper, the, most of the study shows a uh, not significant difference, no significant difference between the contrast agent uh, for terms of CIM. And the guideline, uh, had been changed at 2009, two years later from the first guideline. Right? Uh, in patients with chronic disease undergoing angiography, either an isosomeral contrast media agent, that means uh, eodixanol, VZPAC, or a low muscular weight contrast agent other than eohexol. That means uh, all other low osmolar contrast media except eohexol actually equivalent to VZPAC in terms of uh, uh, nephropathy. The only eohexol had now became a bad contrast media. But actually, there is no scientific comparison after Netflix study uh, of VZPAC to uh, OmniPAC. So actually, there is no scientific evidence except that only one study, the uh, eohexol is a bad contrast agent. So the con in, with that kind of uh, uh, argument, the guideline is changed again. 2011, that means the two years later of the focus guideline, actually they delete that recommendation at all. So there's some happening from 2003 to 2011, 
Well, the, some some uh, research revealed that uh, some specific contrast media is better for uh, prevent CIN than others, but the other studies uh, give us against evidence, and the guideline has changed and changed, and finally uh, deleted. So, the uh, uh, hydration is only one remaining recommendation uh, for the prevention of CIN at the time. But now this also uh, be challenging. The amazing study uh, conducted by Joachim uh, in Netherlands, and then this is this article is published 2017. They do prospective randomized phase three open level in, in non inferiority trial for the contrast media induced nephropathy. In the patient group with EZF uh, from 30 to uh, 59, and then they uh, collect uh, 660 consecutive patients with a randomly assigned, and the result is uh, quite interesting. The CIN happens eight patients from uh, 307 in non-hydration group, and then happens in A among 296 in hydration group. There is no difference at all. So they conclude that the hydration has no uh, financial or uh, clinical benefit to prevent uh, contrast in this nephropathy. So in at least this uh, EGFR group, it is proven uh, the hydration has no uh, meaning for or prevent CIN. So the guideline uh, from ESCL and the ACL guideline is changed, and the ESCL guideline says that patient to EGF for less than 30 uh, maybe need uh, hydration. The ACL guideline 2021 also indicate that the EGF for less than 30 indicate that uh, hydration. But as you know, the we didn't have we don't have any evidence the uh, patient with the lower than 30 has uh, some beneficial or not. Only we prove that the uh, patient has EGFR from 30 to uh, 59 has no beneficial from the hydration. Let's move to our focus to hypersensitive reaction. So annually, uh, the instance of a uh, hypersensitive reaction goes uh, rapidly increased uh, because that number of CT itself is increased and number of user contrast media is increased and the report is also increased. And maybe there is some other reason to increase this uh, hypersensitive reaction. So let's uh, review the guideline from the ESUR. This is actually old guideline. We have a new one. Let's just start from the, the old one. They uh, they state that a different iodine-based agent for previous reactor uh, will be one of the uh, to reduce the risk of acute reaction. And then consider the use of pre-medication. So they recommend two. One is uh, uh, two uh, pre-medication. One is uh, changing the contrast media. The other one is uh, pre-medication. But ESR guideline uh, 10.0, two years ago, has uh, changed something. Uh, different contrast media still valid for preventing uh, hypersensitive reaction. But pre-medication is not recommended because there is no good evidence of its effectiveness. That's a big change at the new guideline. Let's just see the ACR guideline. ACR guideline 2017, it's also old one. It here, changing contrast media within the same class may help reduce the likelihood of a, a contrast reaction. And the effect size of a switching contrast media actually may be greater than that of premedication alone. But combining premedication with the changing in agents seems to have a great effect. And then new guideline comes 2021. Actually, they also agree there is no evidence. Neither study was sufficiently powerful to evaluate the efficacy of premedication in the prevention of moderate to severe reactions. Nonetheless, many experts believe that premedication does reduce the likelihood of a reaction in high-risk patients receiving low small iodine contrast media. So the ACR guideline says that, yeah, they also can agree there is no uh, enough uh, powered study to show the efficacy of the premedication, but still maybe there is some benefits. So I think the premedication and also hydration in CI has a, a similar 
uh, situation. All the study was proven the high osmolar contrast agent. In this, now we are uh, using low, low osmolaric contrast agents. The some uh, practice is not uh, the uh, proved uh, enough enough for it. So changing the contrast media, one of the good issues, uh, important issue to prevent uh, hypersense reaction. I will introduce two study from my institute. Re-exposure to raw similar iodine contrast media in patient prior moderate to severe high test reaction. This is a multi-center retrospect cohort study. So this is a retrospective, not a, a randomized clinical trial. In this study, we found uh, when we use a different contrast media, which shows the previous uh, adverse reaction, the breakthrough ratio, recurrence ratio is goes down almost half in the total of moderate in severe groups. I will skip the uh, pre-medication part. And the other study also shows when we change the contrast media, contrast media changing group has uh, almost half a uh, breakthrough recurrent ratio uh, in patient with the previous hypersensitive reaction. That uh, decreasing is more evident in the moderate and severe groups. So I conducted a nationwide multi-center registry study to reveal this phenomenon. So I uh, collected uh, almost 200,000 uh, cases for a month period from the seven hospital in the uh, Korea. In total, there was a adverse hypersensitivity adverse reaction in uh, 1,401 cases. That means 0.72%. Among them, only 1.1% patient complained a severe uh, adverse reaction. That means uh, uh, severe cases is uh, quite rare when we are using contrast media. And uh, fortunately, there is no case of uh, that uh, during that during this study period. So we summarized the result and published that in uh, radiology uh, 2019. So we have uh, 1,433 cases of a hypersense reaction and the we uh, we has a match the negative control from the patient doesn't uh, patient doesn't have a high percent reaction and we compare the risk of a high percent reaction in these two groups and there is uh, some recurrence uh, among them 195 cases and then we found uh, 375 cases has no recurrent high percent reaction despite they has a previous history of a high percent reaction we compare these two groups to uh, the risk of a uh, recurrence of hypersensitive reaction. This is a result. The uh, use of a contrast media for last 10 years doesn't have any risk factor. Actually, it is some protective uh, uh, actions. And then the hyper history of a hypersensitivity adverse reaction is the strongest uh, risk factor for the hyper, uh, re new uh, uh, another hypersensitive reaction. And drug history, drug allergy history, and patient allergy disease, asthma is also has some positive effect. Interestingly, we found the family history uh, in the contrast with the other reaction. The number is quite small, but the patient with a hypersensitive group, the family history of a contrast with the other reaction is a significantly high. So that means uh, there is some maybe genetic background for that. So we do some uh, research about this the family history of contrast media of the reaction and the found some gene that mean that is HRADRB1-1502 is associated with the uh, iodine contrast ADR related anaphylaxis. So in general population, that gene has only 6.6% prevalence. But in patient with uh, anaphylaxis, that gene has uh, up to 53% prevalence uh, patient with eohexo uh, anaphylaxis and the eobitridol, eopamidol, eomeprod, all the contrast media adverse hypersensitivity reaction, uh, high anaphylaxis reaction patient has a, a higher uh, prevalence of this gene. So we think this gene also uh, related with the hypersensitivity reaction. This gene is known as a uh, to very severe drug allergy uh, related to drug allergy so maybe that's uh, some kind of a genetic factor of contrast media reaction let's go back to our study 
uh, the previous history of iodine contrast media exposure and then <clears throat> exposure itself is a protective. The odor ratio is 0 0.5. But patient has a history of a hypersensitive reaction that the odor ratio goes up to 200. It's a really, really uh, big risk factor. And the family history of a hypersensitive reaction to contrast media is a uh, odor ratio, has odor ratio as 14. Uh, when we compare the record patient group to see what is the preventive measure uh, to reduce hypersensitive reaction recurrence, the pre-medication with antihistamine, not steroid, is a 0 0.53 uh, odor ratio, and the changing of iodine contrast media is 0 0.51 odor ratio. So these two actions actually, actually uh, can prevent hypersensitive reaction recurrence. But the free medication has some debate, but changing of iodine and contrast media is proven again in our uh, nationwide registry study. So the key point from uh, my study is a history of contrast media adverse reaction is the most important risk factor for contrast media adverse reaction. And changing of contrast media can reduce the chance of hypersensitivity adverse reaction. But we can raise another question, another important question, changing with which contrast media can reduce the uh, hypersensitive reaction? Any of them or some of them? To answer that, we I also uh, conducted another study uh, in I, my institute. It's a single center study, retrospective and five years span. The immediate and mild reaction, immediate mild reaction to CT contrast media, uh, strategy of uh, contrast media re-administration without particular steroid. In this study, we have a total number of 1,178 patient with a risk exposure of 3,533. Some of them has a, uh, use a different contrast media. Some of them use the same contrast media. In the breakthrough ratio, the breakthrough ratio, that means the recurrent ratio is a 20.6.9% when we use the same contrast media. When we use a different contrast media, the breakthrough ratio is only 9%. That's a uh, big difference. These are combination of contrast media. So some combination of contrast media actually uh, shows a very good low odor ratio. That means a preventive action for contrast media adverse reaction. But some combination of contrast media actually uh, not to change it, or sometimes already looks bad, uh, re bad result uh, of uh, our pre for preventing preventing hypersensitive reaction. The eohexol, eopromide, eobitridor, eohexol, and eobitridor and eopromide. These three contrast media uh, exchanged each other's. The result was best. Eobitridor and eopamidol and eobitridor and eobasol combination shows any show, uh, don't show any beneficial. Uh, for changing contrast media to prevent uh, adverse reaction. Maybe there is uh, some uh, similarity of contrast media in, in the structure, but we don't know exactly about that. But uh, this is a recurrent patient, recurrent patient, and then the combination of the, each contrast media is so many, you can see the number of the patient is not enough for each combination. So this is a kind of a very difficult study to do, uh, and then I I can make this kind of a tentative uh, conclusion, but I'm also uh, confess that number of each uh, combination group is not so enough. So we need maybe more bigger study to uh, see this uh, uh, proper uh, combination for reduced hypersensitive reaction. So this is uh, my last uh, study, master slide. So prevent recurrence of iodine contrast media adverse reaction. Uh, there is two preventive action. One is pre-medication, but that is a uh, uh, debate and uh, now challenging about its efficacy. And then changing the contrast media is uh, only one remained uh, important prevent preventive uh, action to reduce iodine contrast media adverse reaction. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, young Professor Wanli. And uh, please uh, stay with us uh, at the end of the session for the Q&A.
and uh, congratulations for the very good results show in the study. There's no death uh, during a long period and the huge number of the patients. Congratulations. And now we move uh, uh, to the next presentation of uh, Professor uh, Rick Piska come from the Seattle. Uh, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just get my uh, audio uh, shared. Okay. Hello, and thank you for inviting me here to give a talk. Today I'll be discussing CT radiation safety, common questions. My name is Gregory Kitschka, and I'm from uh, VA Puget Sound and also University of Washington in Seattle. And this is ASCII 2021. I'll be discussing CT radiation and biological effects. I'll discuss how low can you go in the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable radiation. I'll also be talking about imaging pregnant patients this is because I feel like this is one patient population that even though we are all familiar with the literature, there's a lot of anxiety whenever this situation arises. Then I'll discuss dose savings with dual energy CT because dual energy CT is becoming more commonplace and people are motivated by potential dose savings. But you have to be careful because there are only certain areas where dual energy will save dose and there's some other areas where you need to be careful. Finally, I'll talk about high resolution detectors. They are on the forefront of imaging and I think in the next 10 years we'll start seeing ultra high resolution CT and photon counting CT machines installed at multiple locations. Okay, let's first just briefly talk about how we quantify radiation dose. There are three metrics that we use for measuring radiation dose. The first um, uh, measures the amount of ionization that occurs when the radiation passes through air. It is a raw number that essentially tells you the, the energy and amount of photons passing through a volume. When this is imparted on a piece of mass, such as a body, it gets converted to the absorbed dose in milligray. Um, and that is a number, uh, again, that is only dependent on the output from the x-ray source. It has not been converted in any way uh, using numbers that are, are based on assumptions or a model. And then finally, we have millisieverts. This is the effective dose. This is the amount of total radiation given to the body that takes into account what kind of radiation it was, what might be the biological effects, and, and it attempts to equalize radiation from different energy spectra in terms of how harmful they potentially could be. Now, this is a talk about radiation and CT and the focus really is on understanding how can we decrease dose. But I just want to be upfront and let everyone know that higher dose on a CT exam always equates to higher quality when you hold all other things constant. There's no way around that physical principle, which is why to get a lower dose we have to turn the dials and knobs on some other features on the CT scanner to take advantage of new technologies or offerings that allow us to drop the dose but keep the scan quality the same. So as we're going for as low a dose as possible, how low can we actually go? That dose quality relationship is, uh, you can't get around it as I said, but one thing you can do is decide, well, how much can I get away with? 
And that really depends on the clinical question. What is the lesion and abnormality you're looking for? So these are two CT scans. One is uh, showing images from a chest, and the other is the mediastinum. And I'm showing you a pulmonary, uh, a pulmonary nodule. They're, they're nodules of varying sizes. And as you, as you decrease the dose, you can see the amount of noise in the image increases. However, for the pulmonary nodule, the conspicuity of that lesion is essentially equal to what it is at 5 millisieverts and 1 millisievert. That is not the case for the necrotic mediastinal lymph nodes that you see here. As you increase the noise, it becomes difficult to confidently say you're looking at necrotic lymph nodes. And the reason for that is the amount of signal. The difference between the abnormality and the adjacent tissue is much smaller with the lymph nodes compared to the lung nodules, a nodule of 40 Hounsfield units sitting in a sea of 80 Hounsfield unit voxels. This is those two extremes put next to each other to, to drive home how hard it is to confidently say necrotic lymph nodes are there, where here you saw them easily. But the pulmonary nodules, I can easily diagnose that at both energies. This is why lung cancer screening studies are so high dose. Now, this example is easy to understand um, because we essentially look at the standard deviation of noise to, uh, in an area that is homogeneous, and then you look at the signal. Uh, in this case, it would be 40 Hounsfield units uh, compared to 800 Hounsfield units in lung. That difference there is your signal versus here you're looking at something between maybe 60 household units and 40 household units, which is a very, very small difference. So it is that signal divided by the noise, the standard deviation. Now this has become complicated in recent years because of the advanced reconstruction techniques. I'm showing you an image here that was uh, reconstructed with iterative reconstruction. And if you notice, the CTDI is, uh, is lower than it is for this study here, which was essentially filtered back projection done on a 16 slice scanner. So we've got 16 slice scanner here and 256 slice scanner here. And I can tell you that when I measured the standard deviation out here in air, it was actually lower in this study despite the dose being lower. However, look out, look here in the ascending aorta it is very difficult to appreciate the fact that this person has an intramural hematoma. So it is, so with the advanced reconstruction techniques, this whole method of looking at your standard deviation and your signal and knowing how much dose you have to give becomes complicated because the noise has changed. The, um, the process that is generating noise has changed. All right. So it is not just signal and noise that matters, it is also the size of a lesion. The larger a lesion is, the more noise it can tolerate, all right, or the less signal it can tolerate. So this is a low contrast phantom that you see here. I actually have a, a diagram here of the phantom and all the different uh, values. And of course there are these lesions that get smaller and smaller within each attenuation uh, category. And what I want you to notice is that while you can definitely tell that there seems to be a lesion here and maybe here, possibly here, I do not see anything in this location, even though I know that lesions are present there. As a lesion becomes smaller, it is more difficult, such as it's in this case here, to actually perceive the lesion. And Perceptually, it is because there, is, there are less pixels for your eye to average, and, and um, that makes it more difficult to confidently make a diagnosis. So the larger lesion, the more dose, the, the more noise you can tolerate in an exam, and the smaller the lesion, uh, the less noise you can tolerate. So again, with uh, uh, our situation uh, showing it right here, you have three things that affect 
conspicuity of the image. You have the signal, which is independent of dose, the size, which is independent of dose, but the noise, which is totally dependent on dose. So it is all about the noise. And here's an example of, of um, how this plays out. I have an image here, a patient who actually had a thrombus in their left atrium. Now we're accustomed to expecting contrast enhanced exams to diagnose an intracardiac thrombus. But what's interesting is in this patient here, the thrombus in their left atrium is so large, you can actually make that out without any contrast being present. And uh, this is the MR study that confirms the presence of that thrombus. So again, size does play a role. So what kind of, what kind of dose do RCT scans have? Well, they've essentially been dosed based on the clinical question. If it is a coronary CT, uh, you want to be able to make a diagnosis in something that's maybe three or four pixels wide. Those have a, um, a signal-to-noise ratio of about 30. If it is a regular chest CT, those have signal-to-noise ratios of about 15. Um, it depends on the study. But at 30, you're basically able to see an abnormality that is about three or four pixels wide. Now let's talk a little bit about pregnant patients. We're just gonna jump onto this topic. Um, my worst case scenario, or at least the scenario that everyone always dreads, is you have a you uh, have a patient with chest pain and you obtain a beautiful cardiac CT. You let the patient know that everything is normal, they can go home, and then they proceed to inform you that they're pregnant. And uh, the question is, what do you do about this? And if you had known that beforehand, would you have proceeded to scan them? And as in all cases, this is a question of balancing uh, safety with um, in the form of as low radiation as possible with quality, which gets you the diagnosis for the patient. In a pregnant patient, we want to think about uh, how a fetus, baby, embryo, receives radiation. So the x-rays are absorbed in the patient, as I show here in this image. And the majority of scattering that occurs is Compton scattering. And this, uh, in Compton scattering, your x-rays will actually... Uh, let's say they are originating from above the patient, uh, they strike a piece of volume in the patient, they will actually scatter in multiple directions based on this graph here. I'm going to superimpose the image of the patient's body. And of course, okay, that's our slice that we're imaging. We are striking that volume with an x-ray, and you do get some scatter toward the fetus. Now, the degree to which it scatters in that direction is much less than the degree to which it's back scatters and forward scatters. However, there's a small amount that does scatter in that direction toward the fetus. Now, there's a distance between the imaged volume and the fetus, and the amount of radiation, how deeply it penetrates, is based on, on this Compton scattering graph here, where this is actually the imaged volume, and this shows the, the amount of radiation within that volume, and it is these tails here, areas you did not image, but they received radiation, because in these volume, in this volume here, there was actually scattering occurring outside the imaged area. The good news is these tails are extremely short, okay? And so there is very little radiation that would reach a fetus when it is more than a few centimeters outside the volume. However, if a patient is, is later in their pregnancy and the fetus is actually extended all the way up such that maybe uh, the uterus is not far underneath the diaphragm, 
then there would be more exposure to that fetus. So how much radiation do they actually get? The amount of fetal radiation, if we look at what our uh, what we do at our institution, at our institution, our average uh, cardiac CT has a DLP of 320. So if I round up to say 400 DLP, dose to patient, how much does the fetus get? Based on that scattering profile, a fetus that is uh, later in pregnancy, so close to the diaphragm, would have these values of radiation, okay, at 400. Now, the 75th percentile for cardiac CT is one, uh, 1,230 DLP, significantly higher. And under that situation, uh, with, the, with the highest uh, gestation, the fetus would, get three, would have a DLP of 3.3. So what does 3.3 mean? Well, sorry, that's our worst case scenario. So basically, uh, uh, the literature states that there has been no observable ill effects of radiation under 50 milligram. And we're talking about 3.3 as an absolute worst case scenario. So we are well below that mark of 50. And when you move to 50 to 100 milligram, it is uncertain or no effects at all. Third to fourth week, it says probably none. Five to ten weeks, unclear. But there's there's never been any evidence to suggest there's an ill effect of the fetus at that age. Once you go over 100 milligray, mind you, we are now 30 times above our worst case scenario, then there are possible effects. So overall, the risk is low. Um, Internal scattering causes 97% of the abdominal dose, and the abdominal shield therefore does virtually nothing. But we put it on anyway because it tells the patient we care, and it reminds the tech that we should reduce dose as much as possible. And when you think about the dose to a pregnant patient, it is insignificant compared to the baseline background risk to fetal health related to any of these abnormalities listed here. For example, a childhood malignancy occurs at about 35 per 10,000. And we're comparing that against something that has never had any detectable risk, which is why we proceed to image those patients. Additionally, there are risks to the mother uh, healthy babies need healthy mo mothers and these are all the non uh, motor vehicle accident or homicide causes of death in patients uh, in, in uh, pregnant women and again the imaging can mitigate the risk for some of these and so for that reason the societies uh, specifically ACOG has recommended that keep radiation as low as possible you counsel patients on radiation exposure, but if a patient needs a study, you do it because that is in the best interest of the fetus and in the interest of the mother. And use abdominal uh, shield. It has very little effect, but we do it anyway. All right. Now, um, there. Uh, let's talk briefly about dual energy CT for a minute or two. Uh, this is a you know technology people are using more and more and I just want to state that uh, Dose in dual energy CT. Yes, it can be saved by doing virtual non-contrast images But without the virtual non-contrast images Single phase CT studies where you have no interest in virtual non-contrast or material decomposition there is the same or slightly increased radiation dose to achieve the same image quality all right. Uh, however, if you do want to do virtual non-contrast, there are certain situations uh, where that does make sense. For example, a stent graft follow-up where you generally have multiple phases, or say a um, CT urogram. Here we have a contrast-enhanced image, the virtual non-contrast, and the true non-contrast. And you can tell they truly are they're they're different, um, but the virtual non-contrast is good enough uh, most of the time. Um, this was uh, one study where they looked at uh, uh, patients with 
um, abdominal CTA, and they did virtual non-contrast, and they stated that uh, the virtual non-contrast was acceptable 71% of the time, and that was based on just a qualitative review. All right. Um, however, again, compared to uh, polychromatic images uh, from a single source scanner, the dose will be about the same or higher. And it's also important to remember, everyone is interested in material decomposition, but the studies uh, that show you the material decomposition, okay, or an iodine map or something, they have not been designed to, to provide those uh, with the same conspicuity as the polychromatic images. Okay, last thing I want to briefly mention is uh, high resolution detectors are coming. Uh, they are lower noise, uh, which is fantastic, which means you could drop dose for the same resolution. However, when you increase the resolution of those detectors such that the detectors are twice the resolution in both directions, so four voxels for every one voxel on an old detector, that means that you need to increase the dose approximately fourfold if you want to maintain the same type of image quality. Um, there are many advanced things out there, such as spatial uh, current modulation or all types of reconstruction techniques that are very advanced to drop dose. But I want to remind everyone here as a final thought that the best way to reduce dose, the most effective dose reduction technique is to not scan a patient when it is not indicated or where there will be no benefit. The dose savings from that is incredible and nothing can compete with it. So in summary, um, the minimum dose that can be tolerated depends heavily on signal and size of the suspect lesion. Right? Um, thoracic or cardiac imaging in a pregnant patient that would help treat or diagnose a disease should always be performed. There should be no concern about dose to the fetus. Dual energy CT has the same or minimally increased dose compared to single energy studies. However, you must remember material decomposition or VNC images may have decreased conspicuity of disease than you anticipate. Um, higher resolution detectors will require significantly more dose, but I still am personally excited about their arrival. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kichka. And what the PT is that you did not uh, show any slide about the uh, safety of the CT in the pand COVID pandemic, maybe the, in the next time. And uh, now that we move to the next presentation of uh, Stefan uh, Chou Chi Wei concerning the medication uh, in cardiac imaging. Uh, Chou Chi Wei Stefan is the head of cardiovascular imaging department of radiology, Queen Mary Hospital. He is the chairman of examination board, chairman of the CME subcommittee, chairman of uh, education and research fund the committee, Hong Kong College of Radiology. Please, Stefan. Hello everyone, I am Stephen Jern from Radiology of Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong. Thanks to the organizer of SK2021 for inviting me to give this talk on medications in cardiac imaging. I would like to share some of my experience with you. Um, our practice may be more aggressive or more conservative than some of you, but just see what we have gone through in the past years. In general, medications used for cardiac imaging are very safe and side effects are not very common or they are usually mild and manageable. However, a few years back, a case hit the news in Hong Kong about a patient receiving so-called higher than optimal dose of beta blocker and subsequently developed heart failure and also succumbed soon afterwards. So that brings to the media attention about use of drugs in cardiac imaging. That also brings us to the point that we always have to prepare for the worst and resuscitation, including equipment, training, etc., has to be in place whenever you're giving drugs to a patient. In CTA, we commonly give heart rate lowering or stabilizing drugs to achieve better results. 
Arguably, these drugs are becoming less important for newer scanners because of the faster scanning speeds, higher temporal resolution and various software to compensate for the motion artifacts. However, I would still say that a slow and stable heart rate is very important in terms of you don't have to use multi-segment or multi-bit reconstruction and that usually translates into a narrower padding and less radiation dose to the patient and also better image quality. Metopolo is still the most commonly used drugs in our setting and I suppose in many other centers. It is a very safe drug and oral drug is actually very cheap. However, IV metoprolol is not that cheap, so um, there is a price difference between the two, but IV would mean that you can titrate very well and give small boluses at one time. Of course, before giving a drug, you have to check for contraindications. There are some absolute contraindications as well as some relative contraindications to beta blocker that I'm sure you are very well aware of. For absolute contraindication, they would involve a severe aortic stenosis, low BP, severe COPD, asthma, heart failure, second degree or higher degree of heart block, sick sinus syndrome, and also patients on varapamil. Relative contraindications will include first degree heart block, mild and well-controlled asthma or COPD, patient already on some heart, low, heart rate lowering drugs including digoxin and dutyosem, and mild degree of heart failure. So in patients with relative contraindication, you may like to give smaller bolus at one time and a lower maximal dose. Some side effects are seen only with long-term use. That should not be of our concern because we only give the patient for a few doses for the scan. What are the frequent adverse events? Uh, I would say more commonly you will see bradycardia, maybe hypotension, and bronchospasm is not very common, but sometimes it can happen, as well as allergic reaction and also uh, AV block. So how should we give it? Uh, that depends on your local practice. You check for the heart rate and the blood pressure. If there is no contraindication and you want to lower the heart rate, then you can give either oral or IV drugs. Oral drugs, we usually give 50 milligram. And for IV, we give a bolus of 5 mg or in smaller patients, 2.5 mg of metoprolol. And you can repeat it every two, three minutes uh, as, as required. And the maximum dose is usually about 20. If you achieve the heart rate that you want, then you can stop giving it and do the scan. How much IV metoprolol can you give is a question that we commonly got asked. And in my practice, usually it's 20 to 30 milligram, depends on body size, etc. But in literature, up to 50 or even 60 milligram have been given safely without complications. So that depends on individual patients and also uh, monitoring of the patient status after the individual bolus of IV beta blocker. This is how we record our, our protocol, that we check the blood pressure, pulse, and before and after giving the drug. Before you give it, you have to check for contraindication yourself. In our request form, we include questions for the referring clinicians about contraindications. But still, we need to double check with the record, including allergy, what kind of drugs are the patients on, what are the diagnoses the patients are carrying, etc. And one thing that if you are at the scanning site, it's good to look at the ECG rhythm because if you just look at the heart rate, you may miss cases of sick sinus syndrome. That may, if you look at the ECG tracing, you may uh, notice periods of tachycardia as well as periods of relative bradycardia. These patients are more susceptible to the effects of beta blocker, and you may like to give smaller bolus or a lower dose in, in total. And this is how we record, uh, how we give the drugs and, 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 and uh, what are the, 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 the response of the patients. So what are my experience? I think uh, oral drugs may act better if you allow enough time. However, because you have to wait for at least an hour, then you cannot give everyone oral. Otherwise, the first hour you have no case to scan. And IV tends to work best in older subjects and not so fast heart rate. 
Beta blocker works in cases of atrial fibrillation, but in general, the effect of lowering the heart rate is not as good as for patients in sinus rhythm. We keep the patient for 30 minutes after the scan, check the BP and pulse before discharge. And BP commonly is lower than pre-scan, that's usually okay because the patient is now more relaxed and also with the effect of the beta blocker. So what about if side effects occur? Now, if hypotension, bradycardia, etc. occur, assess the patient. If this CPR, then start CPR. Uh, the effect of IV drugs is usually about 30 minutes. For oral, it is about two to three hours. The plasma half-life of both are about the same. It's about three to four hours. So if necessary, keep the patient supine, give some IV fluid. Uh, IV glucagon is a drug that can counteract the effect of beta blocker. So if needed, you can give it, but because of the short half-life of glucagon, it has to be repeated. And side effects include nausea, vomiting, etc. And if not necessary, don't give atropine or beta agonist. And if needed, you can do external pacing, but uh, the patient needs sedation. We also give IV dutyrosam, and usually in bolus of 10 milligram. It, IV slow bolus injection. It lowers the heart rate and lowers the BP. In my own experience, if the patient has contraindication to beta blocker and you give the tyrosam alone, usually it does not work very well. The heart rate lowering effect is not obvious. Uh, we sometimes give it after giving beta blocker for the synergistic effect that commonly works. However, beware of marked drop in blood pressure with the two drugs combined together. Although the heart rate may not show such a dramatic decrease, the BP can drop a lot. So be careful about this and monitor the patient closely. Ifebridine is another drug that we sometimes use. It is a drug that acts on the SA node. It lowers the heart rate, but it does not affect the contractility and the effect on blood pressure is minimal. We can use it in patients with asthma and it can be used alone or in combination with beta blocker. It is contraindicated in acute MI, unstable angina, heart failure, etc. However, ifepridine has different protocols, and the main problem of it is that it does not act very quickly. There are different protocols for using ifepridine. You can give 5 mg or 7.5 mg. As I said, it can be given alone or in combination with beta blocker. However, it at least has to be given a few hours before CT scan. And for the optimal effect, usually it has to be given for a few days before the scan. So that adds to the logistic difficulties of the whole scenario. That's why this is not very commonly used in our department nowadays. Nitrate is another very important drug that would allow for better visualization of the coronary arteries is usually given sublingual as a spray or as a tablet. In the past, we used spray, but with the COVID epidemic, we changed to uh, tablet again. Main contraindication, apart from allergy, is hypotension, and also patients who are already on phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. These drugs should not be given for patients who had taken the phosphodiesterase inhibitor within 48 hours. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors are also used for pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, and the two combined together can give rise to severe hypotension. Sometimes we give double dose of nitrate to patients who are of bigger body build to achieve a better effect, and headache is very common afterwards. And after giving nitrate, there is also a transient increase in heart rate. So you may like to wait for one or two minutes before you start the scan to get the, a better result. Then I would go on to talk about agents used in MRI for stress tests. The most commonly used drugs would be uh, dobutamine as well as adenosine. Both of these would increase the coronary blood flow. And in uh, dobutamine, there is also a increase in SA node and AV node conduction, while adenosine tends to decrease the conduction and can give rise to AV block that in some cases can be high grade block. However, dobutamine would not give rise to this uh, nodal blockage 
but they give rise to ectopic beats or even tachyarrhythmias. One point worth noting is that if you bring up an abnormality with dobutamine stress, the patient is already having myocardial ischemia at that stage. However, because adenosine works mainly by a steel phenomenon, ischemia is not present when an abnormality on perfusion is noted. And adenosine also has the beauty of a much shorter du a duration of action than dobutamine. Let's look at vasodilators, especially with uh, adenosine more closely. Its half-life is less than 10 seconds. It uh, increased the coronary blood flow by three to five times. Because of the steel phenomenon and lack of reserve in vessels distal to a high-grade obstruction, you can see a steel effect and a perfusion defect on uh, myocardial perfusion. Diperitomo block cellular uptake of adenosine is in general not used in MRI in our setting. There are different adenosine receptors that give rise to different effects and also different side effects. A1 receptor can decrease the heart rate and delay the AV conduction that can give rise to heart block. Other receptors can result in bronchospasm. In general, the most important contraindications to adenosine include reactive airway, that means asthma who need regular bronchodilator therapy. For mild cases of asthma who does not need regular treatment, we can try to pre-med the patient with bronchodilator in MRI and then proceed with the scan and start with a lower dose of adenosine. If there is no bronchospasm, we can step up the adenosine infusion. Other contraindications include higher degree of heart block like second and third degree, very low blood pressure, say less than 90 mmHg, and very high blood pressure, more than 180 millimeter mercury. And also if the patient had caffeine within 24, 24 hours. Some people would uh, push the limit to say that if caffeine more than eight hours before the scan is also okay with a higher dose of adenosine infusion. We also adopt a similar uh, strategy, but if the patient had caffeine within three or four hours, then we would reschedule the case. For, to prepare the patient for the adenosine stress, uh, they should not take caffeine say 20 hour, uh, 24 hours is the best. We do not ask the patient to stop beta blocker. We do a ECG 12 lead before the scan to look for ischemia, etc. And during the scan, we would have continuous monitoring of the patient. We start with an infusion rate of 140 microgram per kilogram per minute and keep it for four to six minutes. If the response is suboptimal, that means there's no significant drop in BP by 10 mm mercury or increase in heart rate by 10 beat per minute, we will step up the infusion to 170 or if not successful, 210 microgram per kilogram per minute. There are now some centers utilizing mapping techniques of the spleen to look for adequate stress that I have no experience on, but uh, that would also increase the uh, uh, ad adequacy of stress, to say, so to say, so to avoid the problem of inadequate stress. This is our protocol and we will record the hemodynamics and also any possible complications before, during and after the uh, stress test. Side effects, uh, minor ones are very common like chest discomfort, flushing, dyspnea, drop in BP. These are actually taken as signs of adequate stress and the patient should be reminded about them so they don't get very nervous. But if the chest discomfort, etc., get very uh, serious, then we should stop the infusion. Major cardiac events like uh, myocardial infarction are very rare. Bronchospasm can happen, so, uh, and also high degree heart block can happen occasionally. Because of the short uh, duration of action of adenosine, usually stopping the infusion is adequate for the side effects. If required, you can give an antidote in terms of a slow IV injection of aminophilin of 125 milligram diluted in normal saline and then injected slowly IV. That can uh, cure problems like chest pain or shortness of breath. Another stress agent that we can use apart from vasodilator are the inotropes and commonly is dobutamine. 
it is a uh, beta 1 receptor agonist that can increase heart rate, increase cardiac output, increase contraction and oxygen demand of the myocardia. It achieves coronary vasodilatation with increase in flow by about two to three times. We usually reserve dobutamine for cases who have contraindications to adenosine. It is also our first choice for cases with anomalous coronary arteries referred for assessment of ischemia. Uh, some people believe in this, but others will still use adenosine for this indication. So dobutamine usually requires an IV infusion that's step up progressively while we are reviewing the motion images, the CINE images with every increment of the dobutamine dose. That means you need, at least for our center, we need two persons to do the scan. One in the scanner to accommodate the patient and adjust the drug. One outside to look at the images to look for new onset wall motion abnormalities. We started with a low dose of 5 microgram per kilogram per minute and gradually step it up to 40 or even 50 microgram per kilogram per minute. And we commonly add atropine at the uh, maximal dose of the glutamine infusion to achieve the target heart rate. Of course, uh, there are conditions that you have to stop the infusion. For example, you have achieved target heart rate. The patient has uh, angina, very low blood pressure, very high blood pressure, or you detect new onset wall motion abnormality on the CINE images, etc. So these are listed in our protocol here. Major complications, uh, the most worrying part would be acute myocardial infarction, which is fortunately very rare. And also sometimes we see uh, tachyarrhythmias in terms of sustained SVT or VT. Uh, isolated ventricular premature bits are quite common, up to 30% of patients 6% or so would have by Germany and non-sustained VT in about 1% of patients. So be ready for all this and if required, uh, you need to bring the patient out of the scanner to, def to do defibrillation. Blood pressure is another very interesting observation because sometimes you will see severe hypotension in these patients, uh, up to 4% according to the literature, and we have to stop the infusion and stop the test. Why the patient would have severe hypotension is not entirely known. It is uh, said to be related to parasympathetic discharge of a vigorously contracting heart and may be also related to relative obstruction at the LV outflow tract with a very hyperdynamic uh, uh, contracting LV. However, uh, most people do not think that it has prognostic value. However, a few studies, including this one published in International Journal of Cardiology, found that patients who develop severe hypotension, that means more than 20 millimeter mercury drop in blood pressure during dobutamine stress, in this case is echo, they tend to have worse outcome in terms of survival from cardiac death upon a follow-up of up to seven years in this uh, case series. So apart from stopping the, the dobutamine stress test with hypotension, it's worth to document its occurrence for reference. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for the attention. And the next version of ASCII in 2022 will be in Hong Kong. So I look forward to welcome you to the Congress, either in person or online. So with that, uh, I would uh, stop my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung. That was an excellent talk. And uh, now, now we are at the uh, point to field any questions from the audience. Uh, there were some questions that were submitted through the online Q&A that were uh, answered by the speakers. Uh, I'm interested to know if there's anyone out there who would like to submit a, uh, submit a question or uh, would like to verbally ask a question. All right, I, I don't see any questions. I, I, I have yeah, a few questions. No, oh, I sorry, please go ahead. I hear someone I chiming in there. Yeah, I think just there's a question for Professor Wan Li concerning the, the, uh, the first question is from the Kan Wai John Chan. 
Uh, concerning the steroid cover, is the oral route like uh, 40 milligrams methylprednisolone more effective than IV the hydrocortisone? I think that's another question concerning the presentation of Professor Wan Li. Yeah, the, there was a study of IV steroid is better than oral form in the maybe that's an era of uh, high osmolar contrast agent period. But uh, now the uh, using steroid itself has not been proved, so the oral IV <coughs> form does no uh, has no meaning. So in our hospital, still we use a uh, steroid in the case of a uh, severe uh, adverse reaction uh, cases, but in mild reaction cases, we do not use a steroid at all. But the use of steroids may still in, in debate. So if you don't have any police about that, you don't need to start using steroid in the hospital to uh, prevent uh, adverse reaction or contrast media. Now the recent recommendation is not, uh, not recommended using steroid. And uh, there's another question uh, on the box. Uh, another question is, uh, is and acetine 16, 600 milligram BD useful in chronic renin disease patient? Yeah, so I skipped that part in my lecture. The uh, bicarbonate and, and acetyl cysteine is a quite uh, old issue, uh, which can uh, prevent uh, CIN. The bicarbonate has proved and now we can see using bicarbonate for prevent CIN in ESUI guideline. But NC steroid acetine, we uh, has a recent uh, NEJM article of randomized control tri clinical trial of use of uh, N acetyl to prevent, uh, uh, to prevent uh, a CIN. There is no uh, additional effect uh, over placebo. So uh, the using N acetylcysteine has no significant effect to prevent CIN, so you don't need to use that. So now we have only uh, two options for prevent CIN using hydration in patient with a GFR less than 30, that's quite low, and then uh, bicarbonate, yeah. And concerning the medication, I have a question uh, for Stephen. In the practice, uh, is the radiologist who prescribes the medicament for the patient or the cardiologist who follows the patient to the radiology department and uh, uh, who participate with the activity? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, for cardiac CT, the radiologist would do all the prescription on site and the cardiologists are not involved in, in that sense uh, unless there are problems, but usually there's not. And for the cardiac MR, we work collaboratively with our cardiologists, but um, not every time the cardiologist can be present. And we can do adenosine quite confidently on ourselves, there's no problem. But if we are doing dobutamine stress, especially in high-risk cases, we would try to ask the cardiologist to join us on site. That that's our current practice, but otherwise we'll do it alone. And in this case, uh, do you have a training program that specifically for the radiologists who perform the cardio imaging and oh. you pro provide uh, some kind of license for the radiologist? Yes, uh, in my center, everyone who enrolled in the training program for cardiac imaging has to obtain ACLS certification before they start. So um, that's that's the, the minimum point. And we are not asking for regular recertification yet, but there are some in-house resuscitation drills that we conduct regularly to, to, to make everyone fresh about the, the skills and the equipment are constantly checked for, for its function. That's, that's what we are doing. Okay, thank you. And I have a, a question for the uh, uh, Professor Oblova. Uh, sometimes you see that in the practice, uh, as a patient come to the radiology department with a uh, American device, with, uh, but uh, we, we don't know uh, what it is. And there's no um, document with the patient. And in this case, uh, what should you do? Yeah, that's indeed a very common occurrence. Um, so uh, usually what we do is we have our um, technologists uh, do the screening triage, and when that's identified, we do a radiograph. And that's how I started my lecture, do a radiograph and try to identify the device as per radiograph. 
if the device is very old, then we may not proceed until we can get uh, access to the detailed data of the device. If it's a recent device and most likely a, a conditional device, uh, then we may proceed after consent with the patient. And I did not have time to visit uh, the website uh, you mentioned in the presentation, but uh, is there the uh, uh, atlas of the device uh, by the radiograph in the in the website? Because uh, for, for me, for example, when we see the radiograph, I don't know what it is like the device. That's a very good point, and it not in that um, particular website. But there are a couple of uh, apps, applications that have been recently developed to recognize device. If you search on your app uh, device, uh, X-ray device recognition, there is uh, actually one very interesting app that you just uh, scan, uh, take a picture of the radiograph, and it tells you what kind of device. So that's very useful. OK, maybe the, you can provide some that's app uh, name and some more information by the Yeah, uh, by absolutely. The I'll okay, put in the chat. Much. And uh, I have a, another question for Professor Wan Lee. And 